So we're looking at Socrates' theory of the forms. And the forms is this idea that apart from this physical world, there's also an intellectual world which we used to have before being born. And so again, before you were sucked down into this physical life, there was a, your soul kind of wandering around out here in this intellectual realm. And out there, you encounter the forms of, of everything there is to know. So you encounter the form of perfection. That's how it is that you know what perfection is, even though you've never experienced perfection in this life. That's how it is that you know what infinity is, even though by the fact that you're a physical being, you're, you're subject to limitations, specifically about you know, temporal. You're only going to be alive for so many years. Um, that's how it is that you know what a chair is, how you know what the color green is, um, everything. The idea is that once you're born, you're pulled down into this life, and your soul is essentially trapped or imprisoned into a body. And that your body is exactly as you interact with the world here. Now, again, a common mistake that people make when they talk about the allegory is they say that it's about, you know, the world that you see is not the real world, and that, you know, this is just an illusion. Uh, no, no, no. The, the, the physical world that you inhabit is real. Uh, if you don't believe that, you can step in front of a bus on Highland Avenue. You're going to find out just how real the world is. Um, you won't be around to, to experience much of it after that. But the point is that you, it, it is actually real. It isn't an illusion. But it's not this intellectual world that we are souls used to inhabit. And so this is, of course, problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, the idea is that you have a physical body and that you use your physical body to, to experience the physical world around you, but your body is corruptible. So, for example, your sensors, your senses, which we kind of use to gather all of our physical information from, are, are corruptible, and they make mistakes. You mentioned last time, you think you hear things that you didn't actually hear, you think you see things you didn't actually see, um, you know, um, and so forth. We'll, we'll keep it there. And then, also, it's, it's, it's also the source, by the way, of, 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 our, of our existential crisis. The idea of, of having a physical body, I mean, almost every day you're reminded that your physical body is, is, is dying away. I mean, just this morning I got a big old scratch on my finger because I went to move something, and I scratched my finger on, I think, one of these things up here. And you just kind of look at that and go, huh, just scrape some skin off of your body. Why? Well, it's not perfect. You know, it's dying away. Yeah, it'll heal. But things aren't quite the same after they heal. You may have a scar or something like that. Um, but it's a good reminder that your body is not perfect, that it does get damaged, it does um, decay over time. And so that means that you're trapped very tightly in this little, however long window you are here for, 75 years, 76 years, um, 18 years, 20 years, however long you're here for. And that whole process is tragic, it's painful, this is what it is to live. And so that's why going through life is tragic, because you're aware of the limitations and that your life is going to end. Well, if you understand that, but you also understand that you're not just this body, but you're also this immaterial thing, and again, Jung would look at that and call it the psyche of the soul, or we would call it. And if you understand that you're both of these things, or as Jung points out, this duality of man, that you're both of these two things together, your, your mind and body, your soul and body, then you understand that this is something that's for this world, and that this is something that belongs to the intellectual world. Um, again, the process, therefore, of being born, you was so traumatic, you forgot everything, and so life is just a process of trying to, rem uh, trying to remember what it is that you forgot. And so as a teacher, I can't, I can't tell you anything, teach you anything that way. I can't convey information that way. Instead, what I can do is just ask you a series of questions to remind you about the things that you've experienced before out here in the intellectual <coughs> world. Yes. Now, um, again, this thing out here, Socrates refers to it as the intellectual world, the spiritual world. We Maybe Jung would call it the collective unconscious. So there's just a parallel kind of idea that's going on there. Um, questions so far? So everything that you experience down here in the physical world is a representation or an imitation of things that you've experienced out here in the, in the intellectual world. So for example, a chair, um, a chair no, no chair on this planet is perfect. But instead what we do is we make chairs that remind us of the chairs that were up there. So down here they're imperfect. See, in this case it's backwards, it's not quite the same. But everything in this world down here is an imitation 
of the things up there in the, in the intellectual world. So it's us kind of being reminded about things that we've experienced before and then trying to duplicate them um, on this planet, in this, in this life. So far so good? Okay. So the implications of this, of course, man, it's pretty phenomenal, it's pretty deep. Um, if you understand the idea that this is, that this life here is temporary, and that it's decaying, it's dying away, it's imperfect. Well, I would to ask you, which one does it make more sense to invest your time and your life in? The development of the thing that's dying away, or the development of the thing that's eternal? Or Socrates would say that developing the things that are eternal. Because if you understand this about yourself, that you are these two things, and that this thing that's down here is corruptible, man, a whole bunch of stuff is just not going to matter to you anymore. You know, the, a lot of the things of this world are just, they're just uninteresting. You know, the things that just don't mean anything, like, especially the things that are, that are, that are purely superficial to this planet, this world, this life. Things like, um, you know, what, what color is a, is a person, what race is a person. You know, that's, that's something that happens here. Up here, you don't have that kind of stuff. You know, what class is a person, what, what gender is a person, what, what, um, Ethnicity, all of these things that, that, are, that are subject just to this world down here you're going to notice are the things that divide us. The things that don't divide us, the things that actually unify us, are the things that happen up here. And that's why it is that you'll come across something I was saying before. It's not just you who's running around out here in the, in the intellectual world. It's other people as well. And so you encounter them. And that's why it is that maybe you'll come across a person here and you'll look at them and you'll be like, hey, I feel like I've known you my whole life. I just met you. Or maybe you just feel like you have a, a, a special connection with a person, and you don't really understand why. You know, maybe 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 you're separated by like culture and class and all these kinds of things, but you still get along super well, and you just don't know why. There's a good chance that you knew them from this intellectual world, that you interacted with them back then over there. You know, and then if that's the case, and then what that means is that you're seeing this person with you're seeing their soul with your own soul. You know, yeah, you might look at them and go like, I feel like I know you. Where do I know you from? If you've ever come across someone like that, and then like they'll be like, I don't know, I just moved here from Washington or whatever. Like, so there's, maybe there's no way you've ever seen him before. But you're like, I don't know, I feel like I, I've met you from somewhere. I feel like I know you. That's, that's your soul seeing their soul. Of course, you've got these bodies in the way that are, that, are, that are making it difficult to recognize exactly where you saw them from. But, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of, it's, it's like the mask of the persona that's being shown. But that's why it is that you'll recognize these people. And so these are the things that bring us together. The things that are down here, again, are the things that are imperfect. They, by nature, physical world decays. And that means that all of the things that it enforces drive us apart from each other. You know? So the more that you're up here, even when you're here on this planet, the more you're up here, the less you're really worried about what happens down here. You know, the more you're down here, the more you're consumed by what's down here and you don't have time to, to focus your energies on the things that are up here. You know? An example I used last period, um, Mark Zuckerberg, for example, the guy who started Facebook, owns Facebook and all that stuff, um, he's known that for, for wearing the same thing almost every day, he has a great hoodie that he wears. And if you see like you know, pictures of him talking, it doesn't really seem to matter where he is, whether he's in a board meeting or whether he's addressing, you know, a conference or whatever, he's always wearing like a, almost, I think it's a blue t-shirt and, and, and a gray hoodie. Why do you think he wears the same thing every day? And by the way, if you, according to him, his closet is just full of gray hoodies and similar t-shirts. Why do you suppose he wears the same thing every day? So they can recognize him, maybe? Does it have to waste time choosing what to wear? Yeah, does it have to waste time choosing what to wear? Because yeah. what's, he, what's he busy doing? <coughs> So one more time. Updating stuff for Facebook. If you updating things for Facebook, yeah, developing Facebook. In other words, he's got some place he has to be, in a, in a sense. In other words, he's way too busy <laughs> worrying about how to how to maximize Facebook, how to make it the best company he can make it. He doesn't have time to sit there and go, what shirt should I wear? Because it just doesn't matter to him. Does the shirt he wears is that going to impact Facebook at all? No. So therefore, he doesn't concern himself with it. He only concerns himself with the things that are part of this mission that he finds himself on. And you're going to find a lot of people like that. Remember Steve Jobs from Apple? Guy always wore jeans and a black turtleneck. 
Why? He had a closet full of jeans and black turtlenecks. You know, why? It's, he didn't have time for anything else. It wasn't like, I'm just so busy. It's not just that. It's just, I don't care. Just grab a t-shirt and go. What does it matter? What matters is Apple. What matters is Facebook. I used to have a, a professor at, at UCLA. His name is Gavin Lawrence, British guy. He, he had gray t-shirts and gray, like, gray, I guess, darker gray dicky pants that he wore every day. And this is an interesting guy. He talked about Aristotle. And he, he was talking about Aristotle's conception of the body, for example. He's just like drawing on himself with chalk. You know, and people are kind of like giggling and laughing. Like, oh, he's drawing on himself with chalk. And there are a few sitting, sitting there going, shut up, stupid. There's a point here. You know, who cares if he's drawing on himself with chalk? In other words, you get distracted by these silly little things that, that really don't matter. And so, again, for him, it really didn't matter what he wore every day. He was, his mind was in too many other places. Now, this does not mean that if you're into fashion, if you're into those things, you know, stop doing that. It's, it's not that at all. Um, in fact, maybe your, your idea of fashion or, or, or how you, or, or anything physical, makeup, whatever, is your way of connecting yourself to this stuff up here. Maybe. And then there, there can be something deeply spiritual about that. But the point is to be aware of that, though. That if it's something that's not doing that, that therefore your focus is down here and your focus is not here. The more time you spend up here with the metaphor of Apple and Facebook, whatever, that's their mission that they're focused on, the less time they have to worry about those other little things down here. So, questions about that? Easy. All right, we'll take a look at the text itself. Can anybody tell me the time we get out of here? What time we get out of here? Oh, uh, um, 1241. 12 okay, we got time. Alright, Allegory of the Cave from Plato's Republic. I'm going to stop and comment a little bit here and there, but not much. So we're going to read through it once, we'll watch the documentary tomorrow, and then we'll read through it again on Thursday with a lot more detail. So again, please don't write. And please don't drop this. Please don't write on these. Alright, Allegory of the Cave from Plato's The Republic. <clears throat> Important point, this is not a standalone story. He didn't just write the allegory of the cave. This is part of a much larger book called The Republic. So it's important for us to know. So he begins. Socrates is speaking with his friend Glaucon. By the way, Glaucon is Plato's uncle, I believe. Socrates says, and now, let me give you an example so we can see how enlightened or unenlightened we really are. Um, what does enlightenment mean, by the way? To know. So let's see what we know and what we don't know. See how enlightened or unenlightened we really are. So he begins right off the bat with this explanation of the purpose of the allegory is to identify how we know what we know. And what do we know and what don't we know? Imagine human beings living in a cave. The cave has a mouth open toward the light and the light reaches all along the cave. These people have been in the cave since birth and have their legs and necks chained so they cannot move. They can only see in front of them because of the chains. They can't even turn their heads around. They have been forced since birth to always stare forward. Above and behind them, there is a fire blazing at a distance. And between the fire and the prisoners, there is a low wall, <coughs> like the screen which marionette players have in front of them over which they show puppets. Glaucon says, I see. Any friends like Locke in there? Yeah. You'll notice that when you go through so uh, Socrates' dialogues, they always uh, sound the same. I see, of course, certainly, certainly, nothing else. Far truer, true. They're just always agreeing with Socrates, man. Yeah. <clears throat> so describe the scene. What do we have in front of us? Giant cave. It's a cave, yeah. Now, what do we see inside the cave? People, people, people in chains. And they're in chains. And how are they chained up? Yeah, necks and arms, so that way they can't move around. They can't move their heads around. They're just frozen, stuck staring forward. Yeah. And what's behind them? Fire. Fire, yeah. And the fire, and, and uh, there's another detail that's there as well. There's the wall. Yeah, yeah, a low wall between them. So you have, the idea is you might have the fire over here. You have this low wall. And then you've got people that are focused forward. They can't turn their heads around. <clears throat> Glockman says, I see. Now, 
Imagine men walking back and forth behind the wall, carrying all sorts of vessels and statues and figures of animals made of wood and stone and various materials which appear over the wall. Some of the, men, some of the passing men are talking while others are silent. This is a strange image, and they are strange prisoners. You'll see these prisoners are just like us. These prisoners see only their own shadows, or the shadows of one another, which the fire throws on the wall of the cave. So the idea is the fire is behind them, they're stuck staring forward, and all they see are their own shadows that are being cast by the fire behind them. Also notice that Socrates tells us that the prisoners represent us. Notice he doesn't say, it represents you, you're all in chains. No, he says us, us. Of course, how could they see anything but the shadows if they were never allowed to move their heads? Of the objects which are being carried around in front of the fire, they would only see the shadows, right? Certainly. And if the prisoners were able to talk with each other, wouldn't they believe that they were talking about what was actually in front of them? About the shadows being projected onto the wall? They would have to. And suppose further that the prison had an echo which came from the other side. Wouldn't the prisoners believe that when one of the passerby spoke, that the voice they heard came from the shadows of the wall? Nothing else by Zeus. To them, the truth would be, uh, would be literally nothing but the shadows of the images. They would believe that the shadows were the real world. Well, they would certainly have to be. Now, imagine what will naturally follow if the prisoners are released from their chains. At first, when any of them is liberated and compelled to stand up and turn his neck around and walk toward the light, he will suffer sharp pains. Not only will his neck hurt, but the glare will hurt his eyes, and he will be unable to see the shadows. Now, uh, so real quick, so now he's chained up. The idea is now imagine if the person is released from the chains and is compelled to turn around, which is important. In other words, the person is forced to turn around. They don't just kind of do it on their own. So even when the chains are released, the idea is, oh man, that's weird. Chained up or something. They're still staring straight forward. But once they're forced to turn around, they're compelled to now look at the, the light. But what, what happens to their eyes? Yeah, their eyes burn, yeah, because they've never seen fire before. All they've seen is the diffused light up on the wall up before them. For those of you who have who have seen The Matrix, for example, you, maybe you remember the scene where Neo is laying on, the, on this table, he's been released from The, from the Matrix, and um, he's got all those little pins in him and everything, and he opens up his eyes and, more, and he says to Morpheus that his eyes hurt. He says, why do my eyes hurt? Morpheus says, because you've never used them before. Same idea, that they've only ever seen these really dim shadows. So when they turn and they see fire, well, you know, it, it burns the eyes. Now, thinking about it as a metaphor, what does fire relate to that we've already seen in the story? What does fire bring? Light. Light, yeah. And so what does light represent here? Fire. Yeah. We've already said enlightenment. So, so therefore, enlightenment is what? Knowledge. Knowledge. And so therefore, the light represents? Knowledge. Knowledge. Yeah. So you can see this metaphor that when this person turns around and sees the truth, the truth burns, the truth hurts, the truth stings his eyes. Now, imagine someone a teacher, saying to this prisoner that what he has been seeing his entire life was an illusion. But now that he's been freed and is walking toward the fire, his eyes turn towards the real world. And he is now able to see things as they truly are. What do you think he'll say? Further, imagine that his teacher is pointing to the objects as they pass over the walls and requires him to name them. Won't he be confused? Will he not believe that the shadows he formerly saw are truer than the objects his teacher is showing him? Now the person turns around, they see these objects as they really are, and the person's going to be confused. This is completely different from what they've experienced. All they've ever seen are the shadows of those objects. objects. They turn around and they see the objects themselves. Problematic, of course. Far truer. And if he is forced to look straight at the light, will he not have a pain in his eyes which will make him turn away back to the objects that are easier for him to see, such as the shadows? which will be easier to look at than the objects in which his teacher wanted him to look? True. And imagine once more that he is reluctantly dragged up a steep ascent and is forced into the presence of the sun. Is he not likely to be angry, irritated, and won't his eyes hurt even more? When he gets closer and closer to the light, will he not be able to see anything outside the cave? Well, not immediately. He would need to get used to the light. Exactly. 
his eyes would need to adjust to the light of the outside world, uh, the world outside the cave. First, he will see the shadows best, the shadows of the trees, buildings, and so on. Next, he would be able to see the reflection of objects in the waters. Then he'd be able to look at the objects themselves. Finally, he will be able to gaze upon the light of the moon and the stars in the heavens. Won't he be able to see the sky and the stars by night better than the sun and the light of the sun by day? Certainly. Last of all, he will, able, he will be able to see the sun, and not mere reflections of the sun in the water, but rather he will see the sun in its proper place and will contemplate the sun as it truly is. Certainly. Won't the former prisoner then reason that the sun is what's responsible for the season of the, and the years, and that is the guardian of all that is in the visible world, and in a certain way the cause of all things which he and his friends in the cave have been looking at all these years? Certainly. He would, see, he would first see the sun and then reason about him. And then he remembered his old home in the cave and how his fellow prisoners were still chained up in there. Don't you think he would be happy for himself because he learned the truth and pity them because they were still staring at shadows, erroneously believing they represented the real world? Certainly he would. And if the prisoners had contests among themselves to see who were quickest to observe the passing shadows and to name which of them was on the wall and which came after and which would come next, and who were therefore best able to predict the future. Do you think that the former prisoner would care about winning the contest? Or, do you think he would agree with the poet Homer, who wrote, Better to be the poor servant of a poor master and suffer, rather than live and think like them. So the idea is that he's taken out of the cave, he's forced out of the cave, we're told, and then if he's, when he's forced out, he can't see this, the, the, the world the way that it really is. His eyes hurt too much. It's too much coming at him at once. So first he, has, he stares down at the ground. He's able to see the shadows, of course. And then once his eyes adjust a little bit, he can look up and see like the reflections of, of the sky in the, in the pond, in the water, in the lake. And then eventually he can look up and see what we most of us see here. And then finally, after his eyes have fully adjusted, he can look up and he can see the sun as it truly is. He can see things that, you know, the whole world as it truly is. And won't he therefore make a connection that the, that the fire, for example, he encounters in the cave is just a, a representation, it's, a, it's an imitation of, the, of the, the real sun that's up in the sky in the same way. Right? And of course the question becomes, once he finds out the truth, what will this person want to do? Won't he have pity for the people who are inside the cave still who, who believe that this is the real world? Yeah. So what would he do? The idea is he goes back. So it's here... Yes, I think he'd rather endure anything rather than base his life on something he knows isn't true. And imagine once more that the former prisoner is put back in the cave. Wouldn't he have difficulty seeing in the darkness because his eyes were acclimated to the light? But now having been outside the cave, the ability to live inside the cave has been compromised because you've seen something else. You know there's something better out there. And I'll give you a stronger analogy for that next time we talk. To be sure, he got used to the light, and now it would be difficult to see in the darkness. And if someone entered him into that contest before his eyes readjusted to the darkness, wouldn't he look like an idiot because he couldn't name the images on the wall? People would say that he went up out of the cave, and that he came back without his eyes. Wouldn't they say it was better to not even think about going out of the cave? Wouldn't they believe it was better to stay inside? And if the teacher tried to unchain another prisoner and lead him up to the light, wouldn't they accuse him of trying to ruin their life and even try to kill the teacher? It's one thing Socrates knows about, right? No question. Now, let me explain the allegory, my friend. The cave is the world that we see and experience. The light of the, su of the fire is the sun. The journey upwards out of the cave is the journey of the soul into the intellectual world. I believe that in our world, the idea of goodness appears last of all and is seen only with an effort. And when we do see it, we realize that it is the universal author of all things beautiful and right. We then realize that goodness is the parent of light, and the Lord of light in this visible world, and, then, and the immediate source of reason and truth in the intellectual world. And that this is the power upon which he who would act rationally, either in public or private life, must focus his efforts. So, he gives us an explanation there of what these things represent. So... Again, very briefly, <clears throat> the idea is that you're in this, you're, that the people are in a cave. They see these things. They see these things in the cave, and 
think that that's all there really is to it. Of course, why wouldn't they realize there was more to it? It's all they've ever experienced. But then once this person is brought up out of the cave, you know, turned around and taken out of the cave, they get to see the world, they get to see a far truer, more permanent world. In other words, they get to see the things on which the things in the cave are based. They see the fire in the cave, but outside they see the sun. They see, they see the shadows, then they get to see the people as well. Yeah. So all of the things they realize, bless you, bless you, the shadows and the walls are all representations of the things up here in the intellectual world. So, again, it's neat. It solves a lot of problems. It creates problems, of course, if we hold this view, but it also solves a lot of problems as well. It explains how it is that we seem to know things that we shouldn't know. It explains how we really know anything at all, actually. Um, it, it, it answers this question about the five senses. Um, so again, the, the key thing here for Socrates is that the things that you actually know, not the true belief that you have. Remember, we, we talked last time about true belief, that a little kid can, you ask a little kid what's one plus two, and the little kid just answers three because it comes after two. The kid has a true belief. His belief is that three, oh, two plus one is three, but he doesn't really know that it is. He just got lucky by guessing the right number. So we can just argue that that's what most of our knowledge really is. But the knowledge, the true knowledge that you have is the knowledge that you've experienced before with your incorruptible, perfect soul. And that's the only way to actually know real things, is to perceive the, the, the infinite, to perceive perfection with the perfect version of you, the perfect you. So, questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques? Hmm. Hmm. I saved you 150 hours. All right, so um, again, we might see you guys again tomorrow. We'll look at the quote. We're going to look at the documentary. And then we'll be back to this um, probably a week from today. No, no, sorry, Thursday. Thursday. So go ahead and pass up the allegories to the front of your road. Keep the anticipation, guys.